I really appreciate all of you to come to this session. And can I start now? It's OK. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. The presentation yes. is not sure. My name is Kyutak, and I'm currently working in a PUBG as a data engineer. And PUBG, PUBG is a gaming company which services a game named Play on Earth, Play on Earth Battleground, and millions of users are currently playing our game. Today, my core is Jiwan, and I will talk about building a data platform with Spark on Kubernetes. So, oh, this is the overview of our presentation today. First, I'm going to briefly introduce the structure of our data platform. After that, I will talk about the problems we encountered with the previous structure of our data platform and how it led us to migrate our entire platform over to Kubernetes. Then, Juan will talk about what we achieved and improved in the next half of the presentation. As I said at the beginning, I'm working as a data engineer now. So the question is, what is data engineering? There could be many words to describe it, but I, I think it can be simplified as making a reliable data flow. And it, usual, it usually starts with correcting logs and setting up log pipelines for ETL, which stands for extract, transform, and load. Also, data engineers usually focus on the reliability of data flow. So it means I should make a stable and robust data infrastructure to, to move on to the next step of data science, yeah, such as machine learning or testing or analytics. And my team's main mission is to serve all data produced from our game servers. This flowchart you're seeing now is the stages of our main log pipeline we built for our service. As you can see, logs produced from several game microservices are sent to AWS Kinesis log stream. Then it will be loaded into buckets and go through several stages of ETL. Then, uh, uh, so the result of ETL also can be stored in log buckets. However, it is not so useful just storing logs in the storage bucket. Think about this. It is really, diffi uh, it's, it is really difficult and inefficient if data scientists have to start their work from raw log files. Someone should clean and transform the data to have appropriate format for analysis. And to achieve it and pro provide ways to utilize those data, data engineers build data pipeline to process logs and data platform as a workplace for data science task. By using this data platform, now da data scientists can <coughs> can load the refined data from the storage and obtain some insights from the data. And this, da this insight can be shared as a form of business intelligence or report or real-time dashboard. OK, before digging down about the topic, let me briefly introduce about Apache Spark. So Apache Spark is an open source distributed computing framework. It was cre created to solve limitations of memory use, and it provides powerful functions like in-memory processing, highly efficient distributed operations, or developer-friendly interfaces for many kinds of environments such as Python, R, or JVM. And this picture briefly shows about how a Spark cluster composed. One Spark cluster consists of a master node and worker node. And the driver program in the master node takes control over all executor programs in their worker node. Then let's talk about our data platform. Our data platform consists of two main components. One is the, one is the notebook platform with the Jupyter Notebook 
and a part of Spark. So it provides an interactive development environment to our data analysts. By using this notebook and utilities, they can launch their own, own notebook and Spark resources, and they can easily access to their Spark resource through their Python code. And another one is a batch, batch job system with Apache Airflow and Spark. Airflow is a platform to schedule and monitor workflows such as batches or cron jobs. So Airflow stores batch scripts and then submit them to Spark clusters. And here is a simple diagram of the of the of the workflow using notebooks. The platform server receives a request from users and launches AWS EC2 instances. After the instance is launched, the server installs Spark and configures proper settings for Jupyter Notebook to connect to Spark. And then users can start their work on the notebook with Spark resources. How about the batch system? Airflow instance store batch scripts and submit them to appropriate Spark clusters daily, hourly, or even minutely. Then Spark cluster runs those batch scripts and exports the results as forms of database entries or reports or metrics for real-time dashboard. However, we ran into various problems in this workflow. And uh, let's talk about the notebook platform first. In the notebook platform, launching Spark clusters takes too, too many stages like AWS API calls, uh, launching EC2 instances, and install and configure Spark, and so on. Every time we launch a new cluster, it took, it took several minutes to complete them all. Also, these complex stages for provisioning Spark is really fragile, and it, may, it made our process error prone. Uh, since we are running uh, dozens of Spark clusters and more than, more than 500 of EC2 instances every day, uh, this, this kind of error occurs frequently, and <coughs> it took up too much, time, too much time and effort of our engineers. And there also was a problem managing the batch system. The main, main, cause, main cause of the problem was that the system is not flexible enough to handle different sizes of batch scripts. And for example, some of our batch scripts consume several, several hundreds of gigabytes data and write a result. And even some of them are consumed several terabytes. On the other hand, some batch scripts just scan a couple of megabytes of logs. So it was hard to optimize the whole system. It is a waste of resource to run all the jobs in a single big cluster. But running separated Spark clusters for each batch script is not nonsense because we have more than 100 of batch scripts. So in this point, we realized that we need a resource management solution such as uh, Yarn or Mesos. So let's wrap up the problems we encountered. First, it took too much time and too many stages to launch a Spark cluster and notebook. Also, errors frequently occur because of the complex steps of provisioning and a <coughs> large number of our instances. Moreover, we need to optimize resources, resource scheduling for various kinds of our workflows among our batch, hundreds of batch scripts. So that's where we decided to give a try leveraging Kubernetes. So you might want to ask, what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform. It provides a wide range of functions for containerized applications, such as abstracted layer for deployment, container runtime, uh, resource scheduling, or health checking for containers. And the 
final question is why use Kubernetes? And how can you utilize Kubernetes to deal with our problems? Let's discuss about what it exactly helps us and how we can leverage its features. Let's start from the abstracted interface of Kubernetes deployment. Assume that I'm trying to deploy my new application to my Kubernetes cluster. Rather than scripting, uh, rather, than, rather than writing a script for installing and running my application, I just can write a file called Kubernetes manifest, uh, which describes uh, how my application should install and run inside the Kubernetes cluster. And those manifests would be something called pod, which is a specification for how to handle and run containers inside Kubernetes. Or it also can be a service for network bound or volumes for storage. And now, what I, uh, what I need to do is fill out my configuration file and send it, send it to my Kubernetes server. Then Kubernetes automatically create Kubernetes objects for my application. Next is the Kubernetes scheduler. And its main functionality is allocating newly created paths to appropriate node. The important thing is it doesn't allocate paths randomly or, but it takes care of load balancing among my Kubernetes node. Since Kubernetes scheduler is responsible for scheduling resources and balancing the workload of my node, we can easily scale out cluster you know, when the workload gets bigger and heavier. Then it helps us to concentrate, concentrate on the, the, the core of my applications and it's business logic. And uh, this is all I had, and Jiwan will talk about how we actually implemented our platform with, Kuber with Kubernetes and uh, with some concrete examples. <coughs> Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Sihan, and I'll be speaking for the later part of the talk. Um, in the previous part, we discussed about the problem we encountered managing data platform and why the Kubernetes is one solution we can make leveraging. Now, let's begin with how Kubernetes helps us to solve our problem. So, the main idea is simple, to operate, the, operate Spark clusters on Kubernetes so that it can manage the life cycle of the all containers up and running inside the Kubernetes cluster. From the Spark version 2.3, it introduced an experimental feature called Spark on Kubernetes. <coughs> As you can see at the diagram, when the client submits a Spark request through the Kubernetes API server, it is responsible to deploy the Spark driver and Spark executor, which is the means for distributed computing as a path inside the Kubernetes node. So let's talk about how we built our notebook platform based on the Spark on Kubernetes. Here's a brief diagram how user can interact with Kubernetes. As you might see at the diagram, uh, rather than giving all the users full control of Kubernetes cluster, we built a middleware which is an RPC server managing Spark deployments and notebooks. <coughs> so when the user requests access to the notebook and Spark resource, the server, backend server, communicates with Kubernetes package manager to deploy requests in notebooks and Spark resources. Well, this kind of architecture not only helped with authentication or authorization, it also gave us a clear way to examine the user activities for future development. Let me show you a brief workflow on how user work works with the notebook platform. Maybe I should do some demo here, but <laughs> well, as you might see in the screenshot, we built a web interface to manage notebooks and Spark clusters easier. When the user makes request for the notebook, <coughs> the server communicates with Kubernetes and take care of the uh, Spark and notebook endpoints the user requested. Also, on the notebook, user can call the Python API to communicate with Kubernetes and get the Spark resources for submit its workload. So the question is, what happens behind the scene? So that's where Kubernetes works, it behind the scene. 
it keeps the deployed containers, which is Spark and Notebook, up and running, so that engineers can easily observe the status of its deployments easily by a Kubernetes dashboard or its matrix API. So now let's talk about the other part of our data platform, which is Best Infra. In addition to migrating our notebook platform on Kubernetes, we recently started to run our batch subs on it. So <coughs> as Utah covered at the previous part, we have been running batch subs on dedicated EC2 instances or trying to schedule uh, Spark workloads through the scheduling framework called YAN, which is a scheduling framework based on Hadoop. But soon, we realized that optimizing YAN scheduling takes up too much time of engineers' effort and time, and which is not acceptable for the smaller team like us. We only have four engineers in our team. But since we still needed resilient scheduling for hundreds of Spark batch jobs, we decided to try running our batch script on Kubernetes. So let's get back to the diagram. And as you might notice, uh, things are not changed <coughs> and even the same, but the only difference is the airflow, which takes care of um, managing and executing the best stuff. So <coughs> previously covered, Kubernetes supports a way to deploy uh, its own applications in a standardized manner. So thanks to the Kubernetes, we could manage its deployments with unified interface, and we could implement just a smaller uh, feature we need by changing only the small parts of the building blocks. So the question is, so far, we discussed how we run core functionalities of data platform in the team. But although everything worked pretty smooth on the smaller workloads, like just the tens of nodes in Spark cluster and dozens of paths running inside it, but issues have been arise when you scale out the cluster to hundreds of nodes and thousands of paths. Well, there might be many challenges to solve the problem in, uh, in terms of its scalability and resilience. But in this talk, I'm going to cover about the problem, which is related to the Kubernetes scheduling behavior. So let's see how Kubernetes schedules its workload. So the default scheduling policy is to balance the load as much as possible, which means that when the deployment is submitted, Kubernetes defaultly tries to schedule and spread the paths across the node to balance the load. Let's refer to the case where with three nodes on the Kubernetes cluster. When the deployment of nine path <coughs> is submitted, the scheduler will try to schedule three paths on each node, which is balanced load. And the similar thing happened to another deployment has happened, and yet another deployment happened. So far, as you can see, the load seems perfectly balanced, and every part is good scheduled, so everybody looks happy. But let's think about the scenario where we no longer lay some of the workload, and the two of the deployments are gone. It seems pretty inefficient having only the two paths on each node, so we might want to uh, achieve the level of efficiency we want by moving the paths into the other nodes. So it's called draining the node by affecting the paths. As you can see in the diagram, we are just killing the, uh, <coughs> we are just terminating the nodes until the uh, sum of the node and move it to the other node. And we can scaling down the cluster by the killing the empty nodes. This kind of scenario works for the most of the cases, like a um, stateless web server, since the service itself can still be alive, even though one or two paths one or two containers became unavailable at the moment. However, the bad news is this kind of scenario does not work for our use case. Because each part <coughs> in the Spark on Kubernetes works as the Spark, ma Spark master or Spark executor. And it contains portions of data set to run a distributed computing job. So if the part is terminated by eviction, it will cause the data set, part of the data set to be lost, and it will mess up the whole overall Spark jobs. So there might be many solutions for this kind of problem, but one solution we found useful is to change the scheduling behavior of Kubernetes. 
For example, we configured uh, its deployments uh, gathering on the smaller group of nodes rather than spreading out uh, among the cluster so that we can minimize the scenario where we evict a pop or <coughs> a part of the uh, deployments when scaling down the cluster. So you might want to ask, well, how can we change the be scheduling behavior of Kubernetes? So here's the answer. Kubernetes suffers a way to extend a scheduling behavior called, uh, with a feature called scheduler extender. So before the scheduler actually decides which node to schedule the pod or container, it can make the HTTP request to its extender sidecar <coughs> to make some extra priority of the node or make some extra filter of the node so that we can affect the node when scheduling the path into the node. In the team, we had started with uh, testing a simple algorithm like, um, <coughs> like just preferring a newer node or gathering the, all the paths into the uh, smallest number of nodes and developing the algorithm kind of heuristically to achieve the uh, most optimal algorithm for Spark scheduling. So far, we have covered about our journey of migrating our data platform on Kubernetes. So let's talk about so what is improved. First of all, we dramatically saved the engineers' effort and time uh, running its Spark clusters. Thanks to the declarative manner of Kubernetes deployment, uh, provisioning Spark cluster became much easier. So it means previously, we had been scripting out all of the each steps to deploy the Spark cluster, like uh, calling the Amazon API to launch the EC2 instance and get some SSH code to install the Spark or something like that. But after the migrating to Kubernetes, we can just apply predefined manifests and pre-built Docker image to deploy applications on Kubernetes. Since Kubernetes take, takes care of the life cycle of its deployments we have, we could easily run multiple clusters on, Spark cl on Kubernetes, and engineers' time is dramatically saved. What else improved? Uh, we can say resource sharing. As the good talk previously mentioned, we have been running our all the Spark tasks with uh, dedicated EC2 instances, or we just try to uh, do some <coughs> schedule, uh, use some scheduling framework ya like YAN or Methods. <coughs> However, the problem is we couldn't really predict the workloads it submitted, so the one approach we, we could do is just provisioning just enough amount of Spark resources for each Spark jobs, so which sounds like just a waste of resource. After we migrated into the Kubernetes, we can share resources on, on the same node while isolating its Spark clusters inside the Kubernetes cluster so that we can achieve the level of efficiency we wanted. Last, we can mention the monitoring as the, uh, one of the uh, most improvement. Well, some of you may already have noticed the uh, monitor itself and the dashboard you are seeing is basically not the basic feature of Kubernetes. But however, Kubernetes can export its metrics in a standardized manner, which is a feature called Matrix API. You can simply integrate a monitoring service like Prometheus or Grafana or uh, even a commercial monitoring system to achieve powerful monitoring with less effort. So that's almost the end of our presentation. So let's talk about the future works. Although we've got considerable amounts of uh, improvement after migrating to Kubernetes, there are many things uh, to do <coughs> in order to achieve resilience and scalability we want. So I want to mention that one of the future works should be something feature called dynamic resource allocation in Kubernetes. It's the default, uh, one of the default features of Spark, but uh, not recently um, introduced as Spark on Kubernetes. And uh, I think it will be uh, updated at the newer version of Spark. Using the feature, we can dynamically control the resource usage of each Spark workload, so we can achieve the extra degree of freedom when scaling up and down the cluster. There are many other stuff to do, like 
trying try to do the streaming on Kubernetes, or optimizing more of our scheduling algorithm, or make some fine-grained cost analysis or something like that. So let's just finish our presentation with some summaries and key takeaways. So first, Spark works as a core component of our, our data platform. Because of its functionality of distributed computing, we can achieve to process terabytes or even petabytes of data with a smaller size of team. But <coughs> things are getting uh, really, uh, issues are happened when uh, running the dozens of Spark clusters simultaneously. So that's where Kubernetes came in. Kubernetes, uh, leverage on the power of Kubernetes really helped us to solve the problem of resilience and scalability with <coughs> as kind of uh, declarative deployments or resource sharing or something like that. But I want to mention that challenges will still remain when using Spark on Kubernetes since it's still on the experimental stage. So that's the end of our presentation, and I hope this talk will give you some ideas for taking your data infrastructure to the next stage. Thank you for your listening. <laughs> All right, so we do have a couple of questions. It seems that you have sparked quite an interest. So let's, let's go to, to our questions. So the top voted question is, what were the most common cases investigated by the analyst? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So the most common case is, of course, relate, related to the product development. In our use case, it's the game development. For example, <coughs> um, uh, how many users are trying to uh, buy some product, or uh, how many users uh, are returning back to the game after finishing the game, like user retention or active users, or something like that. It's called K KPI. And also, we are doing some kind of ad hoc analysis, like um, so balancing the game. Like we are, uh, some of you guys might uh, may know we are a shooter game, so uh, we can. <laughs> just look up the data, uh, which weapon is the most preferable among the users, or something like that, to balance the game and make product more better. Right, thank you. Yep. Uh, so the next question is, what does the notebook platform mean in your uh, terminology? Uh, is it a reduced complexity development platform? Mm. So um, one of the slides, I covered the, a screenshot of the notebook. So. <coughs> Uh, we can uh, still uh, just run the notebook and use the Spark resources. We want to um, analyze the data, but we are trying to uh, make this uh, kind of workflow using notebook and Spark resources much easier by building a kind of platform for using it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you're talking a lot, about, a lot about Kubernetes. So there's a question. Have you considered other solutions that than Kubernetes and why? what is the reason you did not choose them? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. We previously tried to um, leverage another kind of scheduling framework. Uh, we previously mentioned YAN, which is a framework based on Hadoop. But um, after uh, giving a try a couple of weeks and months, we realized that uh, YAN is pretty um, hard to uh, optimize it. Uh, especially in terms of for the smaller teams. As we previously mentioned, we only have four engineers in the, in the team. And we may need some kind of a more a simple or more easier, uh, easier manageable solution. So that's why we choose Kubernetes. And I think the team is all happy about the choice. Yeah. And also, we tried EMR for our batch, batch analytics, but uh, I think EMR is much slower than Kubernetes, Kubernetes actions, and it, it, it lacks some kind of uh, scalability because we, c we cannot easily scale out our EMR cluster. And, and yes, and that's it. Right, thank you. We still have time for one last question. I yeah, see sure. that there are some players in the audience that, uh, uh, that ha are interested in uh, whether you used uh, ML or some other algorithms to de detect cheaters based on anomalies? So the short answer is yes. 
we are not only doing some kind of heuristics to detect cheaters, but also use the deep learning and machine learning to uh, make some anomaly detection uh, in terms of um, picking up the cheaters. And uh, some of the algorithm are uh, worked, <coughs> but some of the algorithm are uh, not working really good. So we are trying to uh, making the fast iteration again and again to get rid of cheaters as much as, as many as possible. And we spend uh, most of our co our analytics cost for searching cheat users, and these are happiest operation we. We do every day. Yeah, this is a huge part of our all data science workflow. It's almost the half of the data science um, traffic we have, getting rid of the cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so f so much for the answers. Thank you for the for the talk. Uh, we do not have uh, time for all the questions, but I, I'm sure that uh, guys will be happy to talk to you in person. Mm -hmm. So give a round of applause.